quite turn it around. Okay, we're, we're live. Can adjust it. is going and should be able to tell if something goes wrong um, and all the sound stops or something like that. But meanwhile, welcome to um, our home, which is a barn, a semi-converted barn, hence the barn. It was dubbed by uh, Ken Lacoste, who made all the big flutes. He came here for the first time last April. I've got evening tea happening. Hopefully you have your evening beverages, which if we were in the church might be a little more restricted. So let's take advantage of what we can do. You, you know what toilet paper to expect should you need to do that. You have access to the beverages of your choice. Um, of course, a, a couple months ago, you might not have had any toilet paper. Um, so tonight we're here, um, instead of being at Old First Church, which is a great venue, I've been playing regularly there in San Francisco since 2005, thereabouts, and that was with my bass clarinet quartet, Edmund Wells, and that was in the tradition of all clarinet chamber groups having big premieres at Old First Church, because Beth Custer premiered her group clarinet thing in 1990 at Old First Church. And, oh, that's why we're still talking. So the howling is happening here because it's exactly 8 o'clock. That's why we've delayed the start so that we're not interrupted by the bells and horns. Uh, but normally we, we do that. So we'll, we'll be just right back. <laughs> okay, we just did a short, short version there. Um, Hopefully everybody's uh, comfortable, settled in. The plan is to treat this r recital tonight a little bit more like a recital, as if we were in the church, which means for those of you who have joined me for all three, now four, live stream shows here from the barn since April, um, maybe we'll reserve some of my pontificating and preaching uh, until the end when I will get my quarter out of the fridge and have a little Q&A. There are 10 songs on the program. I am going to try to stick with the program that I planned, which you can go to the link in the description for the program uh, that, that was formatted. Thank you, Rick. And 
Uh, Matt Volka is here with us. He is the Old First Church, Old First Concerts uh, curator and director. And um, there's also a link to the Old First Church event page where you can uh, make a contribution donation to the venue. I don't have my link in the description. If you wanted to have some sort of direct to the artist contribution, but it's my email, cb at corneliesboots.com, use PayPal. I apologize for not having Venmo yet. I'll just keep talking while they're doing the, uh, the horns around. So I'm going to start off, this evening is a slight, a sort of a casual tribute to the great Eric Dolphy. For those of you who knew that, that I was uh, formerly a bass clarinet monster, that was my big influence. Um, Eric Dolphy blew everyone's mind in 1961, playing this amazing arrangement, uh, improvisation arrangement of God Bless the Child, showcasing that the bass clarinet was, in fact, the ultimate woodwind with keys. At the time, I thought, oh, the ultimate woodwind, but that's with keys. This is the ultimate woodwind without keys, um, which is the shakuhachi. And I'll talk a little bit more about the instrument for those of you who don't know um, after I get started. But suffice it to say, it's a piece of bamboo played vertically like a clarinet. Comes out of Zen Buddhism. Uh, so tonight, some of you will have heard these recently. There's some very fresh material and some also brand new stuff, including one piece by Eric Dolphy and one that I wrote just kind of as a little uh, tribute to him with a little bit of some of the humor that's in a lot of his pieces. Um, so those are the fourth and fifth songs. Going to start off with a piece I wrote, a short little showcase of a lot of the blues riffs I like to play. I wrote it for the NPR Tiny Desk concert, which was a couple months ago, and we filmed it on that end of the barn. And I actually won the Tiny Desk concert, in my mind. Um, I don't know who actually won or when they decide uh, who won, but I thought I would get some of you going with that. All right, so this piece is called uh, Bamboo Breather Blues. And right after that, I'm going to go right into uh, Dark Tree Moan which is a kind of a, a my tribute to Sunhouse. <laughs> Thank you. 
tree moon.
is he grew up in, and he was a preacher for 15 years before he ever played blues. He was too churchy to play blues, in his words. But eventually, he, he, he wanted to kind of do it all. So this interweaving of gospel and blues in single musicians' lives from early 20th century is um, something that we forget. We kind of think gospel and then blues and blues and rock and roll. But um, And these are the roots of jazz. And I was trained in jazz. And jazz never departs too far. If even it goes to outer space, it's always rooted in blues. And meaning blues and gospel together. Um, and for me, picking up the Zen, Buddhist, solo, priest of nothingness, wandering, breath cultivation tradition of Shakuhachi, uh, it's a, it, it's a no-brainer that the vocabulary and emotion and uh, breath expression of not even just blues or gospel, but just that vocal a vocalist in either of those traditions, plus the slide guitar, plus distorted textured guitar sounds, later electric, um, goes very well with these flutes. So a lot of the sounds I was doing in that piece are quite intentional, although to the non-initiate, it might seem like maybe the flute's not working so well. So you might be used to flutes, concert flutes, that are not just pieces of bamboo. I mean, this grew out of the ground like this. These were the roots, and you can see some very nice roots here. Um, it was hollow, except for some nodes. Uh, so it was harvested, dried, nodes removed, five finger holes, a little shape taken off here, and that's almost it. So it was a derived emergent wind instrument, which is why I call it the grand archetype of woodwinds. It wasn't made, it wasn't built. Um, so our connection to nature is immediate and profound. But this, the, the flute aesthetic that, that you might be used to in the concert hall would be more uh, clean, non-breathy, something attempting, let's get the small flute for this demonstration, something more. That still sounds like a wooden flute. But that removal of breath from the sound is not our priority. Sometimes we clear it up and sometimes we add it in. And these texture distortion sounds are a specialty of myself and my Shakuhachi school with my students who are now coming along with a lot of these sounds. It's the Black Earth Shakuhachi school. And these texture turbulent sounds our a signature aspect of what we're doing, it feels like, let's make sure that we're rooted in the good soil before we grow anything else. Plus, it sounds like distorted guitar. So, hey, Vaughn. Vaughn's over here. That's right. One breath, one sound. Okay, that's a good reminder. And let's play some more music with that one breath. So we're going to go back to the big flutes in a moment. But first, a little, a little blip of my virtuoso uh, a small flute piece, Underground Sun, which uh, you, all of you hear at every concert for the last year. It's only a year old, but you'll see why I need to practice and playing it in front of um, people slash digital minions. Underground Sun. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you, Underground Sun. A little bit of a, a little bit of a virtuosic vehicle, not just for the fingers, but for the. I keep changing the name. Not just it's not just circular breathing that I incorporate in a lot of these pieces. It's um, sometimes we call it uh, uh, enhanced or next level circular breathing uh, because. There might be tonguing required, there might be accents with the breath, and there might be really strong, um, thick bass lines to lay down while maintaining the inhale, exhale simultaneously. So I'm doing it very surreptitiously, um, which a handful of us on flutes do, which means that the cheeks don't puff. The didgeridoo, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, clarinet, bass clarinet need the cheek puffing, and you can tell they're doing circular breathing. Um, some of us, the only other flute player that I've seen do it as surreptitiously as me is Nicole Mitchell, who just released a new album called Earthseed, and um, I'm halfway through listening to that based on the Afrofuturistic fiction of uh, Octavia Butler, whose birthday was just a couple days ago. So Nicole Mitchell is an incredible flute player, also does the surreptitious circular breathing, as I'm calling it. Pardon me while I get some more tea. Okay, so we're going to go back to the big flutes. And speaking of virtuosic, um, I'm going to do a, an Eric Dolphy piece now, although it's kind of one of his ballads. Um, so Eric Dolphy was a, a true woodwind wizard. You can see him over here, some of his albums. Alto saxophone, bass clarinet, flute, which he played all to a high level. He was a practiceaholic, and he... Um, would practice one note sometimes for a whole week, according to an interview I saw with his dad, where he would, and he would record himself and listen back just on the, on the one note. And of course, we have our own tradition of just playing long tones on our lowest note in shakuhachi. So it's my theory that should any of um, our predecessors on the jazz side of Black Earth shakuhachi school's lineage, that being Ross Amaral and Kirk, John Coltrane, and Eric Dolphy, had they lived past uh, their mid-40s, which none of them did, eventually they would have come to Shakuhachi. And as all of you know, there's a heightened awareness, a heightened consciousness of racial inequities in America specifically, but actually all over the world. So somebody like Eric experienced how he was treated more like an actual human being in Europe, like a lot of jazz musicians were, black jazz musicians in the 50s and 60s. So the first chance he got, he moved there. He was from L.A. And... Uh, did okay there. He was a totally clean living jazz musician with no vices, which is, he's the only one I've come across. With, with Mingus, it wasn't drugs, but it was women. Everybody else, it was drugs and maybe both. Um, but Eric was, had a whole tour booked, um, and he was going to play in Japan eventually in 1964, 65. He was in Berlin, and he was like some sort of massive diabetic that he hadn't quite properly um, managed. And so he uh, was in Berlin at a gig and he was dysfunctional and he eventually went into what was later determined to be a diabetic coma. Because he was a black jazz musician, they assumed he had had an overdose and the hospital people just sort of gave him some saline solution and thought he would come out of it when really they could have done a blood test, figured out he was diabetic were it not for the racial profiling, and he might still be with us and be 92 years old. I don't know if Benny Carter's still alive, but Benny Carter lived into his 90s, who was a monster alto saxophone. So there's, there's it's not just the loss of life, uh, but a loss of so much creativity that it's, it's incalculable. Um, so with that, we're going to go into one of Eric's pieces, uh, Serene, which is still a little bit in progress. So go easy on me. And then uh, after that, my little tribute piece to him, Mandrake Walks, which kind of combines two of his titles. Not really an Eric Dolphy style, but with a, a, a tip of the hat to Mr. Dolphy. This is Serene, which was also recorded and released as Sorino sometimes. It's on a handful of, of albums. Always, always good, and he always played it on bass clarinet. Uh. 
How many of you out there know what the word chromatic means? Yeah. Uh, people have a hard time raising their hand that quickly, I know. So the shakuhachi, as I mentioned, has four has five holes. Uh, those form five of the twelve notes that are the full set of pitches within each octave used by um, a lot of music around the world, not all. Some have made more of the 12. Uh, that piece has a lot of those other seven notes, which are in the cracks between these uh, finger hole notes. And how we play those is the secret revealed in Shakuhachi lessons. I encourage you to sign up to find out. Uh, I Really, I just don't want to keep talking to tell you. I'm sorry. Um, but it has to do with the breath. It has to do with these head movements I'm doing. And yes, uh, special fingerings, partial hole coverings, but it's not like a recorder or tin whistle where it's cross fingerings. It's primarily a breath modulation and head tilt, which is how we get a lot of our expressive pitch bends and the textures I was talking about earlier. So right on now to Mandrake Walks. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Thank you. Thank you. You're too kind. Ah, uh, this is the point where I ask everyone how they're doing out there, and if there's any questions. Although we did say we're saving questions till the end. So just think of that question and get ready to type it in eventually. Um, Oh, well, thanks. Okay, well, that's good for the Coltrane. So Coltrane is next. So Eric and John Coltrane were close colleagues, and um, they had quite the symbiotic feedback loop co-influence going on. And when I was researching Eric Dolphy in the mid-'90s, doing a, a pretty big paper on him, his whole approach to jazz and improvisation, I had, it was one of the most fun times I ever had in music school library research because they have all the old downbeat magazines there. And it's like a issue from 1963, maybe, or 64, where they were a, a double interview, which they didn't, neither one do very many interviews, um, was, was like grilling them about if what they were doing was anti-jazz. And of course, both of them were super humble um, sort of cosmic beings actually and didn't get on the defensive externally anyway um, in the interview which I was really really impressed with you know because uh, obviously history has shown that they were just ahead of the curve like a lot of innovators were even though jazz was a sort of like very fast moving innovative field at that time which it had been from the beginning. 1917 was the first jazz recording. The 1940s was a sort of a high watermark of bebop 
innovation. And these guys were, you know, this is 20 years after that, um, the early 60s. So anyway, they both, it's a, it's a great, you could probably find it online. It's Eric Dolphy, John Coltrane, Downbeat, Anti-Jazz interview. Really great answers that are still relevant today. Um, and so there's a couple of Coltrane pieces that when they're arranged, even more than the Eric piece was kind of like a very uh, sort of somewhere between um, Coltrane and Thelonious Monk uh, kind of ballad to me. Um, this piece, Wise One, sounds like a honky It sounds like the pieces we play from the Zen repertoire with a little more of the blues influence, so like my pieces. Um, and this flute is pretty big. It's a little bit bigger. That one's in G that I was playing. This is in F. So... Um, that's why I'm um, stretching to get limbered up for a wise one. So we're moving, we're, we're bridging from <clears throat> avant-garde jazz ballads through Coltrane's cosmic ballad sort of depth, and then we're going to go to um, our devotional reverence uh, honkyoku on the really big flute. Oh, there goes one of Eric's CDs. Um, so actually, I'm not going to talk between these, I don't think. So this is Wise One from Coltrane. And I'll do a little stretching, get a little more tea, and go right into Tamuke, which is the piece we play in reverence to those who have um, passed on, those who have died. And this year, there has been a, a lot of that in my personal circle. And the reason I wanted to focus on Eric, this concert, he happened to be born June 20th in, um, I think, 1928, and he died June 29th in uh, 1964. So this concert date's right in the middle. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, our good friend Ken Lacoste, he made all these big flutes. He, unfortunately, passed away exactly a year ago, two days from now, June, June 28th. And uh, we're still not really able to process that on many levels, um, but we know he can hear what we're doing, and I'm sort of gonna 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 maybe stop dedicating pieces to him in the spotlight so much, like I have been all year, just because when he came to my concerts, it feels like he enjoys a lot being the the audience member and the appreciator and sort of you know um, holding all that basically esoteric knowledge how you how you emerge an instrument from the bamboo that can work, and you can play Coltrane on it. So, or at least you can try. Oh, and Mark Stickman, who is my recording engineer, as many of you know, he, he passed away just a couple months ago. And my cat, who was with me for 19 years. And um, probably other people I'm forgetting. So this is, so those are, those are, and that's just in the personal circle, which I feel like the piece Tamuke is, is designed kind of for that. It's your own reverential, devotional space of communing with the spirits and flutes. Communing with the spirits of a tribe or ancestors is kind of the, one of the original purposes of wind instruments. The cries of the spirits or talking, having a chat with the spirits. So why is one Tomoke? See you on the other side. Mmm. -hmm.
This uh, flute here that I just played that piece on is what we call a 3.2, which is the length. That means 3.2 shaku. And the shaku was like a foot in feudal Japan, the measurement, not the feet. And it was like this long. So shaku hachi, this means that length plus the number 8. So 1.8 shaku in length is this uh, instrument, which has become kind of the so-called standard size, although, as you can see, we sort of question that. To us, this is a kind of a sopranino um, uh, flute compared to where we gravitate a little more in Black Earth School. So the big flutes uh, have always attracted some people to them. The difference with these taimu, which are the wide bore completely pure bamboo inside, no lacquer uh, flutes that Ken and his pal Brian Ritchie uh, kind of um, came up with was uh, these thicker walled wide bore sort of what I call the very white of Shakuhashi. So you can see in terms of what we're dealing with the difference in, let's see if I can get this. So that's, that's about the difference in uh, you know, the flute, the, the standard size compared to the, the fat flute, as I sometimes call them. Um, but that might be not quite um, sensitive enough language. Um, but it is the flute that has thick walls and wide bore. Um, so Ken made all uh, three of these big ones. And this was the last flute that um, I uh, worked with Ken on um, a little over a year ago. And of course, the holes are a bespoke hole placement because I am not putting my hands like this to reach this and have my head up here so we did this uh, for that. It's not that big of a change um, in a way but it's a very long flute. It's an extra baritone uh, bass varietal. On the piano the pitches might not be as low as you might expect for the word bass but there's no keys so that's the, that's the, um, the difference. Um, I was going to say something else about the big flutes, but uh, we'll just leave that for now. So we're just going to come out of the contemplative space. There's going to be three more pieces. Then maybe we'll get out the porter and do some Q&A, um, should you so desire. Um, so back to the medium flute. Uh, by the way, I recorded three albums over the last several years that are all under the heading of Shakuhachi Unleashed. And that features pieces like Underground Sun, but that's not on there because it's too new. So uh, arrangements of like Bruce Lee theme music, uh, Black Sabbath and Pink Floyd, some Jimi Hendrix that I'm going to play a little later, um, on the small flute interspersed with my more bluesy or what I call bamboo gospel uh, pieces on the, the medium-sized time loop. It's a kind of the Goldilocks place of uh, the fingers have quite a bit of facility. The high notes are still kind of high, and the low notes are pretty low and weighty, hefty. Um, this next piece was uh, also too new to be on those albums. But if you like this stuff, um, they're on iTunes, Spotify, and I have actual CDs with great artwork, which I could have um, put up, actually. It was commissioned painting by... Uh, Nakona, who's my 
uh, tattoo art. Oh, that's what I was going to show you. That piece I just played there also. Tamuke, this is the notation. So I don't have to carry sheet music around. This is the first five lines of that piece. This is our um, shagahachi notation, special um, matrix uh, style code that we know how to follow. All right. So this piece is called Holy Old Soul. And to keep the dedications rolling along, I, I decided to dedicate this to my cat, Ludo, uh, last year when it was new. And since then, he has also turned invisible. But he, did, he was on Earth for the last uh, 19 years, so either way, that's the holy old soul, no matter how you calculate it. One final note about the circular breathing. In Honkyoku, which is the Zen Buddhist solo repertoire, that last piece I, was, I played was from that repertoire, it is prohibited to do the circular breathing, sneaky or otherwise, because the entire concept of that repertoire is breath-centric. In other words, there's no pulse, there's no rhythm section, there's no ensemble members. The entire activity is based on cultivating your connection of breath with the bamboo, creating an energetic feedback loop, and extending the exhale on the shapes of those lines that are particular shapes. And the pieces can get pretty complicated. So if you were to grab a breath in the middle of a phrase, you'd be missing the point of the activity. And I treated the Coltrane piece the same way, because I consider it to have been a honkyoku. Um, same with the Dolphy Ballad. So if it's a ballad, if it's got phrasing that's kind of vocal in nature, and those pieces are chant influenced, uh, then you don't do the circular breathing. This piece has that in the opening. The middle section, I can use it if I want to. It's kind of a ballad middle section. The ending section not only requires the circular breathing, but I would have never been able to write it or think of doing it if I hadn't been um, doing this uh, method for many, many years. So get out your workbooks and note the time when the three sections start. I'm joking, just enjoy the piece. It's Friday night. Holy Old Soul. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Holy Old Soul. And that premiered last May at uh, a sister church concert series, 7th Avenue Presbyterian, where I also premiered Underground Sun and uh, a few other things that are still kind of new. And uh, Ken, who, who made the flutes, was at that show. And that was actually the last time I saw him in person. And he joined... Um, myself plus two of my students, uh, Daryl and Kevin, on stage for what became the prototype for my new Shakuhachi Ensemble, Cornelius Boots and the Heavy Roots Shakuhachi Ensemble, which I am happy to report received an Intermusic SF uh, Music Grant Program grant. Uh, and so that means that we will be able to create and premiere um, our, our what I'm calling Woodwind Chamber Saga, which is called Wood Prophecy. And that the, all, all the riffs and pieces of that are sort of coming together in the, the ether and the psyche and in the theta state entrainment, uh, which I utilize a playlist of Sunhouse, Watazumi, and the Reverend E.B. Campbell to infiltrate my theta state uh, brainwaves and and then when I'm practicing the next day, the riffs just pop out. And so, um, but don't tell them because they're going to give us money. So we're working very hard on making these tunes. That's the, that's the great thing about the, the, uh, the creative process and kind of the irony where when it's happening correctly, it is effortless. And so this is why uh, we become undervalued and it's hard to get paid because clearly we're not you know, carrying railroad ties on our back or something like that. But uh, we hope the world is a better place uh, for us being here and doing our thing. So I'm going to just do two more small flute pieces and, and then wrap up uh, the music part. Thanks for everyone who's coming. It looks like we still have um, quite a bit of people um, with us, or at least there's 32 people on the YouTube channel. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Thanks, uh, Bane for being on because it's something like, well, now it's early in the morning. It's the next day for you in the UK. So actually, this is one more um, premiere. Uh, this piece is uh, inspired by the first concert on Old First Church uh, return in June. We, 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 they, they booked a single solo shows one per week through June, we thought we'd be able to get back in the, the church itself, but that wasn't able to happen with COVID. Um, and Sarah Cahill was the first concert. And um, as we've touched on a little bit, these, these issues for artists, um, where as, as it's always been, and we need to push even more now, that Black Lives Matter, and always have, always will. And that is perhaps the most prominent um, issue of um, equity and um, putting energy into anti-racism and non-discrimination, inclusion and diversity. That in the classical world or new music world um, is, uh, it goes hand in hand with uh, gender inequality. And Sarah mentioned this in her, in her program. And even though as a performer composer, uh, I, I tend to kind of write most of my pieces. I do have a lot of arrangements of other people's pieces. And Sarah mentioned a, a simple suggestion of, of, of simply including a woman composer on every program, for instance. And of course, I reflected briefly and thought, do I have in my Shakuhachi repertoire any pieces or cover uh, arrangements uh, by female artists or composers? And I think the answer was, I'm not, I don't think so. So the result was, uh, flipping through the backlog of things I had wanted to arrange, but never got around to, and one was a piece that I was going to arrange years ago f from a group called Rasputina, um, which is um, spearheaded and uh, designed and led by a woman called Melora Krieger, who's a cellist and vocalist, and a great songwriter, band leader, and singer and cellist. Um, it, the piece was called Gingerbread Coffin, and that piece was going to be a little tricky to do as a solo. It would have been better for the quartet. So the song after that on the same album is called Thimble Island, 
and I did arrange that uh, just recently, and I'm going to try to get through that here. So it's a, it's a kind of, like it sounds, it's a kind of a miniature little song, uh, Thimble Island, um, by Melora Krieger of the band Rasputina. If you like um, cellos and singing, I would check them out. And it's an easy name to remember. You just put an A at the end of Rasputin. Okay, Thimble Island. Let's see what happens. Tested authorship. And it was copyrighted by Billy Roberts. Uh, there's some other guy, I can't remember his name, who played it um, and, and claimed that it was a traditional piece from Appalachia, which there's no evidence for. Um, and I think the guy that copyrighted it, he probably ripped off the chord progression from his girlfriend, whose name I'm forgetting. Um, I think she's in the notes down here. Let's see if we can find her name because I don't want to get it wrong. Neela Miller. And I can't remember if she was dating Billy Roberts or somebody else. She came up with uh, the chord progression, which to me is kind of the essence of the tune. Um, the lyrics about what happens, Hey Joe, the, that plot takes place in other songs that don't have this musical content. So to me, the lyrics are less important, particularly playing an instrumental version. And then, of course... Um, Chaz, uh, I'm forgetting his last name, Chaz something from the Animals. He was the kind of manager for Jimi Hendrix at, at the start when Jimi couldn't get a break in the U.S. 
It might have had something to do with race. I don't really know. But he had to go to England to put his band together. And then uh, had Hey Joe and his song Purple Haze. And then he had hits in England. And then they wanted him to play in the States, of course. And he became the legendary Jimi Hendrix. Which I think is funny. When people become famous, you figure that they always knew they were going to be famous. But that's not the case. Um, so Hendrix's version with the great Mitch Mitchell on drums um, is, is, a, is a great song. I don't, from the rumors and the interviews, I don't think Jimmy loved playing it, especially when he had his own great pieces like Purple Haze, but I'm glad he did. And this is my arrangement of it. And then we'll go to some questions and, uh, and uh, wrap it up. Uh -huh. Yeah, somebody wants Freebird. I do play Freebird, you know. Uh, that's on the albums. So here's the here's the albums, everybody. And this is this is the uh, holy flute that's got some metal and originals on there. This one, volume two, has uh, has uh, Freebird on it. Freebird's the last song. On it. Oh yeah. There we go. Bamboo Rising. Look at this. Look at this artwork. Wouldn't you like to have one of these as a as a token of? So this is the the recent one. This has Hey Joe on it. Um, yeah, after Hey Joe, I might feel like playing Freebird. I have not practiced it for a long time, but I did do an arrangement because of the classic encore joke. music for this evening. Thanks for joining me. And I'm going to grab a little seat and see if there's any uh, uh, questions over to the side from anybody in the... And then for those of you just joining us, this is a shakuhachi. This is a bamboo flute from ancient um, Japanese Zen Buddhism with no keys and no mouthpiece, no reed, no gimmicks and no parts. Okay, thanks to Old First Concerts for, uh, for hosting, and we will get back in the church before too long. It's possible we'll do um, the Wood Prophecy premiere there in, in the spring. Um, hopefully we'll be ready by then. And um, 
I think that's, we'll, have, we'll say free bird from another time. All right. Sleep well, Mr. Briggs. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? All right, good. I answered, I answered questions. Yeah, Old First Concerts is always good. And the, and, the, and the church is a good place to hear music, hang out, meet people. Um, and we'll get back there sometime soon. So, um, there's a link down here for those of you who are feeling moved to support. Um, one of these goes to the Old First Concerts event, and one of them's like goes to my mailing list, <laughs> so that's maybe not relevant. Actually, it is relevant. Thanks for reminding me, YouTube video description. Those of you that are here from Old First Concerts that aren't already on my mailing list, um, you can use that link and get on the mailing list. That way, you'll know when I'm performing these works. Mm-hmm. Okay, B.A. Carter has a little paragraph here. Let's see what, what B.A. Carter has to say. Contemplative practice. Oh, well, yes. Actually, that was one of the appeals. When I first heard um, a recording of Shakuhachi, it was called on that CD, Zen Shakuhachi Flute. And I was already reading um, Taoist and Zen philosophy at the time which I can't remember exactly how I arrived at that because my first introduction to real meditation was through um, Eknath Eswaran, who is a great translator of... Um, what are the texts that he translates? I'll have to look it up. Like uh, Bhagavad Gita or something like that. Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita, which you want to have a good translator for a work like that. So that's more still the practice sort of Hindu um, kind of influence stuff. So, but somehow I got into Zen philosophy and some Chinese mountain poetry and Taoist books. And um, wasn't at a Zendo or anything. This is when I lived in Chicago and heard Shagahachi. And I thought, it's fascinating. It's, 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 it was a 2.4. It was medium size. It had that woody, low sound. And of course it was contemplative um, solo meditation music. So it pulled me in from that Zen philosophy mindset, consciousness kind of angle, and from the fact that clearly this was a deep woodwind tradition that I knew nothing about. Maybe in music school they mentioned it, but I didn't remember it. So either I wasn't paying attention and I was concerned with my bass clarinet badassery, and so I didn't pay any attention to Shakuhachi. But at some point, I was really ready for it. So uh, Zen, Soto Zen, Rinzai Zen, um, there's all kinds of good texts, there's all kinds of online communities. Sitting, sit every day. Everybody should meditate every day, twice a day, for 20 minutes each time, ideally. <laughs> or play some long tones. So Qigong also, so the problem with Zen and I might have talked a lot about its benefits, but it's a very profound uh, philosophy and very simple practice that has to do with awareness, stillness, and space, and unending awareness, absolute presence of conscious awareness. Um, what it doesn't always emphasize is about energy flow in the physical body, and what comes from the Taoist uh, side of pre-Zen, this would be the Taoist teachings and, and poets and rascal sages in ancient China, is, is more attention to that. So things like Qigong and Tai Chi and Kung Fu come out of um, energy practice. That's what Qigong translates to. And so Watazumido, who's, who's the Shakuhachi side of our lineage, he was very concerned, according to me, about this energy, and according to my teacher who studied with the one guy that studied with Watazumi. So that's what the lineage is. Um, just energy, different kinds of energy, still energy, moving energy, blustery, unpredictable. Um, and so the breath cultivation and energy practice are, are pretty predominant. 
So the fact that we're playing songs that saxophone players play, um, and that we can do that, um, that's a little bit extra. Like we use that also as a vehicle for, for breath um, cultivation and contemplative awareness state of mind. And as I, as I postulated, uh, Coltrane and, and Dolphy were on the path to that. There's a picture of Coltrane playing the Shagohatsu. His last tour was in Japan, where he was playing the flute constantly, and it was Eric Dolphy's flute, because Eric had died and he left his flute and bass clarinet to Coltrane. So there's a lot of double helix interweaving strands between the path that they were exploring as with jazz as a cosmic expanded cosmic creative um, playground in a way and the um, personal spiritual path as well. Miyako Bushi scale, even though the holes make it Mino scale. Yeah, that star mind ceremony I am not sure about because I um, I studied what the, the names of the scales are in the Japanese musical tradition, but I also kind of forgot them. The reason was, one of them was called the Ean scale, and I found two different versions of what those notes were. And in, in, in jazz background, there's so many complex scales, you, you would never have uh, the same name applied to two different sets of scales that would defeat the whole purpose of having the names. So there's like a Locrian scale, then there's a Locrian number two. It doesn't have that different of a name, but it's a different, it's a different name. So that kind of, I gave up and I never went back to it. Um, but I know exactly what you're saying. Um, my theory on that is the regional uh, folk songs and therefore the chants, uh, the, the harmonic and melodic vocabulary, the, the chants and the folk songs of the areas where the monasteries were in Japan, um, were based in the scale that we find more often in shakuhachi music, which you're saying is the Miyako Bushi scale. And, and um, it, that they just sort of made it work. If they're gonna play shakuhachi and play along with that chant, um, it didn't matter what the scale already was on here. Um, but there's a lot of reasons physics-wise that I think it, it was the right way to go. It could have been a happy accident, as Bob Ross would say. Um, but what you get is the shadowiness of the in-between notes. So that questioner, the main holes, what I call the native notes, play what we would call minor pentatonic. But almost none, and I've written a lot of pieces in that because that's very close to our blues scale, minor pentatonic, both of which are all over jazz and rock. Uh, but almost all the pieces we play, whether it's from the monastic Zen pieces, and a lot of the folk songs are in this scale. And this one. So it skips some of the main note, what we call main notes, and it adds in the shadowy in-between notes, such as or, or, and that adds that great sort of tension, sort of pull to um, the tension. And what my one of my earlier teachers of shakuhachi um, in, in Chicago, before I found uh, my long-term teacher, Michael Chikuzen Gould, this guy, Michael Furuta, was very fond of, and I think he, his dad was definitely Japanese. I don't know if he, if Michael had lived in Japan at some point, but he was a big Shagahashi fan. He was basically a um, Japanese kind of um, cultural guy and loved to, to, to teach a little bit the folk songs, basically. And to play those folk songs, he... He, he, he always would point out that um, he, he told me the Japanese love to have a good cry. And so this, and that, that combined with this nature kind of nostalgia in a lot of the art forms gives you that, that scale um, with all those half steps and space. There's half steps in space and it sort of reflects 
this kind of melancholy, nostalgic, um, romantic pull, heart-based pull to, you know, something. Um, the old days, or the, the, the village you're from, or your, your parents or grandparents or some, some time when you were young. But I think that folk songs and that around the world have that cultural function. Um, but these, these particular scales in, in, in Japan happen to really have these, uh, these half steps mixed with space that give you um, more of that yearning. Yearning, that's the word. There's a yearning embedded within the scales. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I, should, I should memorize these names. Miyako Bushi. I know Mino is a folk song. But, all right. You're welcome, Vaughn. All right, everybody. It seems like everybody's winding down and getting ready to go to bed. Or, um, yeah, it's, it's too late. I'm just going to stick with tea. Or maybe I'll, maybe I'll get the porter up. I don't know. So, um, sign up on my mailing list. Thank you to Old First Concerts. Um, this will just stay up here. Um, I'm not going to take this uh, down. So, if you missed it or saw just part of it, you can... Um, check out that I'm talking to you here but you're actually over here um, yeah well thanks for joining me that was a very uh, enjoyable concert for me I probably will not do another live stream for some little time take a little time off in the summer and write the new pieces I'm supposed to write and maybe in the fall we'll be able to be back in um, venues back in the church and if not the fall then the midwinter of 2021 and if not then then a little later in 2021, and so on. Okay, I think I got to go over to the phone to end the uh, the live stream. Thank you, everyone.